Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you. Uh, two caveats before we begin. Uh, nothing that I say should be attributed to the IMF, even though I still work for it, as it's going to be so out there that it's not anywhere close to a conventional position. Secondly, I will try not to descend into financial jargon. But if a collateralized debt obligation squared comes out of my mouth, you must raise a hand and stop me, and I'll try and explain myself. I don't need to uh, exaggerate or uh, attract your attention with the seriousness of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, five years after the initial tremors in the subprime market in the US, uh, governments and banks and households are laboring under growing uh, burdens of debt. Uh, the US government, even though uh, there is moderate recovery in the US, the US government is still borrowing almost 40% of what it spends. The recovery in the US has been the weakest since 1920. Uh, the UK uh, is havering between recession and a little bit of growth, but this has been a worse recovery than the 1930s. The UK government is preaching uh, its commitment to austerity, partly because it believes that's what's necessary, but also because it is desperate to keep Royal Bank of Scotland funded. UK bank debt is over seven uh, uh, times UK GDP. Uh, if that debt can't be financed at reasonable rates, uh, it overwhelms government's capacity. Uh, the euro area uh, is lurching towards fiscal and political union as it tries to hold what macroeconomists would call a, a non-optimal currency area together. Uh, at the same time, trying to impose austerity on highly indebted economies, particularly in Spain and Portugal. Uh, and so we're facing there either a move to greater integration, which would, was not promised uh, when voters voted for euro entry, or breakup, which would be uh, economically catastrophic and would leave us in legal uh, wrangling for 20 years. The worrying thing is that we have um, commentators, regulatory bodies and so on, some of whom have sensible things to say about how to fix the short-term problems. But I'm afraid we have virtually no one who is giving a view of why did this system get us fundamentally into this problem and how to change course. The best we can offer is going back to a safer version of what has got into the crisis and hoping that regulators are going to be wise enough next time to stop it happening, even though history tells us that regulators are captured by special interests once they've forgotten the last crisis. Now you might have hoped that the church would have had something to say about this. Uh, symbolically, the Occupy movement camped outside St. Paul's for 20 weeks. In one sense, it was waiting for an answer, a response from the established church uh, for its anger as to how the financial crisis arose and why uh, rules that are not applied to other members of society uh, are applied to banks in terms of bailout and loss absorption at the public expense. Uh, after a somewhat confused start, the church had very little to say until the inevitable eviction order came. This is extraordinarily surprising given that for over four-fifths of, it of its history, uh, the church was very clear that lending money for a personal return was inherently wrong. 
Uh, Augustine even said charging interest was theft. Dante consigned moneylenders to the third circle of hell. Uh, the Quran is even more explicit. Uh, o oh, you moneylender, you usurer, if you don't give up your usury, Allah will uh, judge you in hell forever. Very difficult to exegete your way out of that one. Um, and so, uh, however, for the last 400 years, the church has gradually moved away from that position. And I'll, I can talk more fully under questions if you want afterwards about why that occurred. Um, but, it's, but growing out of the biblical uh, tradition and applying that to Christendom up until uh, the Puritans in 1640 we were still writing very strong anti-money laundering, money, money lending uh, tracts, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> tracts, slip of the tongue. So what I'm going to try and do uh, this evening is very briefly come to try and explain why debt has become so pervasive uh, in our society and financial system. And then perhaps the main thesis is on the practical financial side is going to be that actually debt is a little like financial pollution. It is toxic finance. It is subsidized by the a naive wider society uh, and then sets up sufficiently fragile financial systems that it needs bailing out uh, via inflation or default uh, or taxpayer support. I'm then going to contrast that uh, with the Christian traditional critique of debt and interest and trying to explain why uh, that is there in scripture and what its effects would have been. I'll particularly put it in the context of what we call relational thinking. This, is, this may be a new thought to you, but it's the idea that rooted within Christianity that my relationships with God and others are what life is about not what I own, not what I spend, not what I think. Then I'm going to use that relational uh, perspective to diagnose a little of what's gone on uh, with banks, government debt, consumer credit, and mortgages, and then say, how could we move to a different system? Now, I'm not going to say, oh, this will be easy, or we can do it overnight. But what I am going to say is that this gives us a point on the horizon, a compass point uh, to which we should sail. And without that, the best we have is going back to a more regulated status quo and hope for the best. What I hope uh, I'll convince you of is that there is an alternative. So first of all, um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the allure of debt. Why have we come to this juncture. Um, we have debt levels across the whole economy of the UK and Japan at five times the size of the economy and still growing. So in the UK, as, yes, households and banks are starting to pay down at some of their debts, government debt is rising quicker than the private sector is paying down debt. Uh, so governments are being dragged into being borrowers of last resort to keep the plates spinning, to keep the house of cards up. Uh, the US total economy debt level is uh, at its highest level ever, and a couple of years ago exceeded that, uh, that it reached at the worst of the Great Depression. 25% uh, of mortgage borrowers in the US are in negative equity. Uh, if you go to Las Vegas, house prices have fallen 60% and 80% of everyone with a mortgage has a house worth more than the debt. Uh, you're finding that because of student debt, mortgage debt and so on, um, many Americans now are resigning themselves to being in a lifetime of debt. Yeah, they will never pay it off. Uh, there is student debt outstanding in the U.S. for people in the 1960s in significant amounts, even now. 
Uh, we have Greek debt, for instance, in the euro area uh, that is still at 160% of its economy, despite having the largest debt restructuring in history. So, why so much debt? First of all, there are natural attractions to intermediating finance through a debt contract. First of all, it's simple. You lend and you expect the money back with interest. Uh, you don't have to do a lot more than that. Yes, you've got maybe careful about who you lend to, but you don't have to check that they're accounting correctly uh, what they're doing with the money. You can even take security, collateral, um, a mortgage or whatever on their house, to make you feel secure. In economics terms, this is reducing the transaction costs of doing this intermediation. So there are initial transactions, it's e uh, initial attractions. It's easy to transact, easy to account for. Secondly, uh, you can get money, finance now, without giving up control or ownership of what you want to buy with the money. So for instance, if you're running a company, you may not want to, if you need capital, you might not want to give up control to an outside shareholder. So if you borrow rather than give that up, you can keep the ownership and keep all marginal rewards of your effort, pay off the debt, and keep control. Similarly, if you're providing the finance, you may not want the messy aspect of ownership. So for instance, if the UK government is going to invest its foreign currency reserves in another country, it's much simpler to buy government bonds and keep it very simple rather than going and buying companies or land or property in other countries. Much simpler gets you into much less political trouble. Then, thirdly, a debt contract can have, uh, be, feel much more secure. You can take what we call collateral security. So this is why we, one of the easiest ways of financing house purchase is by a mortgage. The lender can seize control of the house if there's a default. And so there's this semblance of security. It's, uh, it makes it certain. And then, of course, we have the idea that debt uh, makes an, a future claim that is clear. It's not variable. It's not like saying, I'm going to invest in a company, and I don't know how that, well that share is going to go. I know that if I lend to the company £100, I should get back £105 in three years' time, for instance. Now, because debt does that, and it makes a, a, a claim of nominal certainty in the future, private debts can therefore circulate as money. Normally, money uh, has been something that with intrinsic value. But from uh, sort of mid-19th century and then as the gold standard broke, what was called fiat money came to substitute that. And then as fiat money, the government monopoly of money creation, uh, then became more uh, too restrictive for the private sector, private monies start to circulate. And when you've got a debt contract that does that, it circulates as money because you think you can get a certain value back when it's repaid. So those are what we call the natural advantages of debt contracts. They uh, are simple, easy to uh, transfer resources, and they become money substitutes. On top of that, we've then advantaged debt. For instance, uh, during the middle of the 19th century, uh, we came up with the idea that, well, the Americans came up with the idea of limited liability for corporations, because it was so hard for companies to raise capital if those shareholders were going to have to pay off the debts the company uh, incurred in all circumstances. So we limited the liability of shareholders and that allowed companies to borrow and shareholders not to be uh, 
on the hook for all those debts. And from then on, that allows companies to get bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger investment projects to be uh, financed. But it also means that companies can borrow a lot more and it's safe for their shareholders to do it because they know that they can't lose more than their shares. It also is one of the reasons why we've got an awful problem with banks because they too are limited liability companies and have this big incentive through that to take risk and le leverage themselves up, borrow heavily. On top of that, we've then given debt contracts historically tax privileges. So, so most of you won't uh, believe this, but up until in my childhood growing up, we, people were given tax breaks to borrow in their on their mortgage. And you were allowed to deduct the interest on your mortgage from your uh, tax liability. Uh, historically, that is the norm. Uh, so in the US, for instance, you, are still get, you still have a tax break on your mortgage. Uh, the, the government seems to want you to borrow a lot to buy a, house, a bigger house than you can afford and to keep house prices higher than they need to be. We do this for companies as well. So all companies uh, generally deduct the interest they pay, but they don't deduct the dividends they pay on shares. So there's a tax incentive for all corporates to borrow. Then we have the small matter of governments inherently subsidizing banks. You have to understand we're in such trouble because banks are an inherently fragile balance sheet. They make two promises they cannot fulfill. First, they say that they can pay you back money uh, for sure at 100 pence on the pound if you deposit it with them. But they're make, taking risks with the loans, and they don't know for sure that those loans are going to be repaid. So there's what's called a solvency risk with banks. They're, they're inherently levered because they're taking a lot of debt and investing in risky things. Uh, but they're also making a promise about liquidity. They're saying to you, if, particularly if you've got a short-term deposit, that if you want your money back, they've got it to give you. But of course, if everyone did that, they run out of cash. They haven't got the liquid assets to do it. So there's what's called, in the, in the jargon, maturity transformation. They borrow short-term and lend long-term. And in many ways, we encourage them to do that, because that's what banking is, like, is about. That helps finance long-term investment. But when you put those two things together, combine it with the fact that for, re for regulatory purposes, we don't need them to keep much capital when they do this, we have an inherently fragile system that only exists because governments effectively backstop banks. Uh, coming into the crisis, um, if you were running a really, really risky hedge fund, you would borrow perhaps five to eight times the capital. When the crisis hit in 2007, uh, Deutsche Bank and UBS were levered, that means they'd borrowed 60 times their capital base. That means that it's like uh, running a, uh, buying a house and putting 1% down, 2% down, but going bust if house prices ever fell below 1%, 2%. But we've done this because governments have been naive about the liability uh, that they have within the banking system. We have given the banking system the payment system to operate whilst they're doing this very highly risky, highly levered thing. Uh, that's like um, putting your grandma in the back seat of a Porsche and giving the keys to your teenage son and saying, drive carefully. <laughs> you, don't, you shouldn't be putting the payments utility, the thing that has to hold up come what may, your ability to pay for things, uh, on a really risky balance sheet. 
which a normal bank is. But we do that and allow that to happen. And banks exist because of the thought that governments will always bail them out. Effectively, um, this is now in the, in the blogosphere, um, banks are effectively organized criminals. And the term bankster is often uh, banded around. And, but this is a, a, um, a sort of respectable uh, way in which finance is done. Effectively, the, the, the payment system, the, the core of the economy, is held hostage. And the banks say, if you don't bail us out, the payment system gets it. Now, you may think that after the crisis, this doesn't go on any longer. But if you do various ways of calculating this, the subsidy that the UK banking system still enjoys from government because it can borrow at much less cost than it would do otherwise, the estimates come out that you, the UK taxpayer, is subsidizing the UK banking system to the tune of 30 to 50 billion pounds. This still goes on because we can't withdraw that government support because the system would collapse otherwise. It's, it's undercapitalized. It's too risky. And we give, in that process, uh, banks uh, a great deal of leeway on how much capital they are to hold because we want them to take risk. So, for instance, if a bank were to finance a house purchase and take the ownership of the house and lease it, which I'm going to advocate later on, uh, the capital it would ho have to hold is multiples higher than if it were to lend to some, a borrower and hold a mortgage against that property. The capital it would hold would be very low, 20% of its risk-weighted assets relative to multiples of what it would uh, be charged uh, otherwise if it had, had outright ownership. So we, from a regulatory perspective, we penalize alternative forms of finance and incentivize generation of uh, credit through the banking system in this way. Then finally, we come to this idea that um, credit has become cheap because we've turned it into a commodity. Whereas, when we had a, a heavily regulated financial system, you needed to know your bank manager. I grew up with my mum telling me that if I wanted a mortgage, I needed to save up first and put it in the building society, and then there's a chance that I would be higher in the queue to get a mortgage. I needed to build a relationship, even if it was in a debt-based system. That is not how banks have worked for 20, 25 years, and certainly not in the US. There is now no such thing as a relation, relationship with your financial intermediary. Because of, if you take out a loan, definitely in America and quite possibly here, that loan is going to be sold on to somebody else through a long chain. So in the US at the moment, because of their inability to generate mortgage finance without a government guarantee, uh, you may borrow initially from a bank that bank will then on-sell it to an investment bank in Wall Street. That investment bank in Wall Street will on-sell it to a, a trustee and a mortgage pool that will then be guaranteed by the government. And so you may think you've carefully selected who you're going to borrow from, but they will then sell it on. Your credit card debt, if you have it, is most likely owned ultimately <clears throat> by a pension fund or an insurance company not a bank. Uh, they're just going to be doing the front uh, processing, but the ownership will be with somebody else completely. The decision as to whether to lend to you is not, hardly has any human element in it any longer. Your data is input into a computer system and the algorithm will give you a credit score and then it will say yes or no and here's the, uh, the interest rate very little human decision involved in that process. Now that led ultimately to what 
what we know now, know now as the subprime crisis because far too many loans were given to people who were lying about their information or had no relationship with the lender, and those lenders didn't care. They were generating loans. They didn't really care about the quality so long as they could convince a rating agency to rate it heavily. So we've applied uh, computing technology, computer algorithms, and replaced financial relationships even within this debt-based world. That has got the costs down and got the costs way down up until 2006, but it means that we don't have any element of relational finance in our infrastructure any longer. So those are the reasons why we have so much debt in the system. There are, in many ways, natural advantages to contracting like this, but also then artificial advantages given to it by governments through taxes and regulation and so on. However, what goes wrong with a debt-based financial system? And I've hinted at some of these already. Um, first of all, you get a much more volatile economy because we have credit cycles. What we, uh, and so during an upswing, when things are going well, Lenders think the world is less risky than it was. And so they need to charge less interest, and they can run on a lower risk premium. And then borrowers see this and say, all of a sudden, the world is less risky. It's cheaper to, to borrow. And they go out and spend more and borrow more. And there's this self-reinforcing benign process of credit conditions easing and demand being increased in the process. The problem is that when a, a shock occurs, something happens, a political event, a war, whatever, and the cycle breaks and confidence goes, the cycle moves very quickly into reverse. Credit standards are tightened, borrowers have to uh, pull back, banks won't lend, and you're seeing now, um, both in the UK and the rest of Europe, uh, banks shrinking being told to shrink and desiring to shrink their balance sheets very rapidly. So, for instance, uh, mortgage credit in Spain uh, is half of what it was a year ago because the banks know that they can't afford to lend and it's too risky. So they've uh, pulled in very rapidly. And so you get the, the normal credit-based system just has this very pro-cyclical process. This then gets worse when you use that credit to buy property assets. Because property assets are in limited supply. And when you see property assets starting to rise rapidly, uh, the incentive is to borrow a lot, put down very little, and start taking leveraged speculative capital gain on rising asset values. And then all of a sudden, the, the lenders think, hey, presto, you can afford to borrow more because your collateral, your house, has just gone up more. So again, there's this kicker, this, um, uh, it, the, the cycle is uh, boosted further on the upside. But then, as things turn around, the specula speculative mindset fall, uh, falls off, and people shut down very rapidly their purchasing of assets because there's no capital gain, and you've got to then sell assets fast before they uh, get uh, greater than the debt. And so we have this strange process now where we have a number of housing markets around the world where people are in negative equity. They can't afford to move. They can't pay off the debt. Um, labor markets are locking down because people can't move jobs. Uh, and if they still retain their job, they're just sitting there just trying to keep the debt serviced. And in particular, uh, a big problem in Ireland at the moment on that score. Dublin house prices have fallen uh, nearly 60% since 2008. Then we have an inherently unstable banking system, as I said. Uh, it operates uh, this risky balance sheet structure. And because banks are limited liability companies, they have an inherent incentive to minimize the capital they run with in order to maximize the gain from their leveraged risk-taking. 
There are political consequences uh, from, for instance, bank bailouts, as we've seen. It rankles very hard with people that the normal rules of um, penalty for failure and reward for uh, effort just go out of the window when it comes to financial institutions because they've set up this system where it's too risky for them to collapse. I'm afraid there's a political cost going on within the euro area where something similar is happening. Because the banking system had been become so uh, integ integrated across the euro area, countries had to be bailed out so that banks from other countries would not collapse. For instance, if Greece had not been bailed out, French and German banks would have suffered much greater losses uh, than they have been able to gradually smooth out the process and, and, and accept them. So because of this fragility, political consequences are being forced through that voters uh, have not been um, consulted about. And effectively, uh, this sort of debt mountain and the, the need to keep it up is forcing through political actions that would not otherwise have been agreed to. We then have the problem of costs passed to third parties as companies and banks and households go bust. You only have to talk to the uh, football players at Rangers uh, who all of a sudden have had their wages cut because the football club has gone into administration. They didn't know anything about it uh, before the event. Um, this process of bankruptcy and limited liability and indebtedness uh, causes companies to collapse and then others, innocent parties, have to absorb the losses, and that includes government. We then have a problem of misallocation of finance. Finance is cheaper if you already have assets to borrow against. Finance is cheaper to those effectively who don't, don't need the financing as severely. And so the, an issue is the misallocation of finance to those with already with security rather than good ideas. Um, we have poor lending decisions. As I've mentioned, this credit cycle induces uh, that problem uh, of uh, booms and busts. I'm also then going to argue that we have endemic inflation because of the need to keep bailing out this debt-based structure. For almost 300 years, while the UK was on the gold standard, the UK price level was roughly flat. It went up and down with cycles, bad harvests, depressions, booms, and so on. But the price of a loaf of bread in the late 17th century was roughly the same as it was in 1913, when we were still on the gold standard. Since 1913, uh, the price level in the UK has risen at least 85 times. That was the last time I looked at the data a couple of years ago. So effectively, a penny in 1914, 1913 is worth a pound now. Why is that the case? Why do we have uh, central banks around the world now desperately trying to make sure that prices don't fall? even though it's perfectly natural for prices to fall. The price of your mobile phone has fallen uh, for the last 40 years, 30 years. Price of televisions has fallen for 30 years. There's no, nothing strange about prices falling. Why, why can't we have prices falling? The problem is ultimately that because we have a, an indebted financial system, we have an indebted household sector, we have indebted companies, uh, we have indebted governments. If the, how, if the price level were to start to fall significantly, those debts in real terms go up. And, th and those borrowers feel much less secure and much less wealthy. The problem is that those borrowers are usually, often, the marginal sources of demand in the economy. So we can't allow them to suffer the consequences of falling prices because their debts then start getting higher. So ultimately, we have inflation, I would contend, because we have to keep 
the system from actually having falling prices. So we have this system, some of uh, a debt-based contractual system, some of which has natural advantages, some of which has artificial advantages. But it causes all these costs, particularly to third parties. And conventional economics, if it even thinks about finance at all, and the sort of travesty of our profession, Donald, is that uh, very uh, little uh, integration of finance into it, economics has been done properly. Uh, but if it thinks about finance at all, it thinks of this as a sort of natural. Th this comes with the territory. We'd hope that we'd have better regulation to do things about this, but uh, it, it's a natural uh, sort of part of the rules of the game. But I'm going to say that this is a sort of pathological symptom uh, of the disease. So, moving on to an alternative. Uh, I'm going to then talk about what might be a relational approach to finance. In one sense, finance is inherently uh, relational. It's transferring capital and finance between parties. Credit, uh, derived, the word credit derives from the Latin for trust, credo. And when thinking about relational finance in the biblical context, you have to understand that uh, Jesus' teaching is based on the idea that love, the, uh, the quality of relationship of love between uh, love of man for God and man for neighbor are the most important things uh, that make uh, life have meaning. Uh, we have nothing uh, without those. They are the, uh, the greatest commandments. Jesus also teach it, teaches that our most dangerous temptation is to worship mammon, worship money, worship resources, as a God, as our source of meaning in life. So with that backdrop, how does the Bible think about debt and interest? Well, first of all, it's very clear that uh, debts have to be repaid. There is a promise that goes on, and hence biblical teaching is very firm that debt should be repaid uh, and that's, a, that's an obligation of the borrower. However, interest-free lending is en encouraged in numerous places in the Bible, in biblical law. This is uh, something that is positive and reinforcing of good relationships. And you know this as well as I do. If you go to your neighbor and ask to borrow a cup of sugar and it's lent to you. This is a relationally positive thing. However, there is intended freedom from debt. In this instance, the most important verse in, the, in Scripture is Proverbs 22.8. Uh, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave of the lender. Because the borrower has given their word, given an oath, a promise to repay, they are no longer free. And so effectively, debt is bondage. It is no surprise that in English, bond and bondage are uh, linked. I've given my bond. I am uh, indebted. I am uh, enslaved in one sense. I'm a servant. However, Scripture is very clear that that's not the intention. Although it encourages interest-free lending, you shouldn't be in debt for very long, and certainly not for your life. So there were various institutions in the Old Testament for how to get people out of debt. So, for instance, if you had a wealthy uh, relative, they had an obligation to buy you out of debt, to mortgage back your house. But if that didn't work, every six years, well, sorry, sorry, every seven years, six years in maximum debt, uh, there was a year of debt cancellation. 
so that uh, debt slaves were freed and no, ev the slate was wiped clean. Why would anyone lend? You only lend in those circumstances when you, you know somebody well or you're going to uh, get some other benefit from that process. Then scripture is very clear that interest is to be prohibited, particularly within those you count as fellow countrymen. Uh, and this is taught throughout both Old and New Testaments, and I'm happy to debate with anyone <laughs> who would say otherwise. Um, inherently, you know that if debt is servitude, then profiting from the servitude of another must be inherently wrong. Going back to borrowing your cup of sugar, if your neighbor charged you two cups of sugar for the one you borrowed, you know that that's unneighborly, that's inherently wrong. And so throughout church history, as I said, up until the 17th century, this was very clear. Nobody really doubted this idea that indebting others for a profit was inherently wrong. That doesn't mean to say that we were meant to be in a socialist utopia or a Marxist state where the return on capital was not meant to be there. As we mentioned, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are in this middle ground where they have a problem with interest-based debt, but a return on capital, be it rental or equity, is uh, appropriate uh, so long as this is rewarding stewardship and ownership of the underlying capital. So what would have gone on in such a society? Uh, debt would have only been interest-free to those in need. There's periodic cancellation of debt, so you could never be in debt for very long, and certainly governments could never borrow more than six years in, this, in the Old Testament. Non-monetary lending motivations would have uh, been what generated the, the lending that would have gone on. Uh, there would have been and the evidence in the Bible that commodity money, silver and gold, were used and that kept the price level stable. Finance uh, is to be channeled through rental contracts or equity investment, not through debt-based finance. And there was then going to be, have to be a much closer link between provider of capital and user. And so, as I've said, through church, much of church history, that was the unquestioned position. It was only in, uh, with commercial pressures in the late 16th century in England, did the idea of money lending at a commercial rate uh, become current. So, first of all, a step back before I get on to applying that uh, closely. Did you notice that there was a contradiction in what the Bible said about debt? That debt had to be repaid, but that the ideal was to be free. That gives us all uh, hints about how to reform a financial system. But the most important application of that in Jesus' teaching is not to how to run a banking system, but how are we to resolve our debt to God. For naturally, through our own sinfulness, we are running up a bigger debt than we can ever hope to repay. And this is the basis of many of Jesus' parables. We are mortgaged up to the hilt, debts of billions of pounds, and cannot repay. Uh, the, the, the possibility is debt is prison forever. What Jesus says he came to do, but also in uh, Paul's teachings and so on, saying through his process of taking that debt upon himself, he wipes our sins clean. He cancels the debt. So when you read these things in scripture about debt and interest, it's not really about 
how to run a banking system. That's not the primary message. The primary message is about who is my redeemer from debt. And that's what uh, Jesus teaches that he primarily came to come, came to do. I'm giving told I'm, over time, I will then briefly set out um, how you'd run a, a financial system on a non-debt basis very quickly. First of all, companies, you would try and move them to a much less levered position. First of all, you remove the tax break for debt. Uh, you try and maybe tamper with limited liability so as to uh, force further loss onto shareholders uh, if things went bad, if uh, too much risk had been taken, particularly in banks. You try and address speculative short-termism um, within equities by trying to slow down uh, the trading of, of shares to make shareholders responsible for what their, their companies are doing. You could give them incentives for doing that. Uh, on banks, uh, you initially do what is conventional wisdom, put more capital in, shrink them down, make banks small enough that they cannot uh, sort of rely on this bailout. So you must address what's called too big to fail, which is uh, an inherent problem within a market system. But then you start trying to move banks onto a non-debt basis. So that means that if they're running the payment system, it's interest-free, and your current account is interest-free. It may be guaranteed by government, but you get no return. If you want to save and get a return, then effectively, if you give it to a bank, they turn it into a mutual fund so that your return on that deposit goes up and down with how the bank invests the money. So a bank in those circumstances can't go bankrupt. The saver loses money if the bank loses money. Moving on to households, how do you get households out of debt? Well, primarily, you have to move the mortgage system onto a completely different basis. You have to start instituting what we'd call lease to buy or higher purchase for housing. How would that work? You put 10% down, the owner owns the remaining 90%, they rent it to you, and you gradually accumulate ownership by paying over the rental. When the house is sold, you work out maybe it's 50-50 and you split the proceeds. There's no leverage in that. There's no speculation. So it would lead to a much more stable property market. Uh, I can't let this go without saying you've got to address student debt. You've got to finance tertiary education in some other way, uh, be it uh, tax or endowments for universities or some other way. Uh, on development finance, we got close with the Jubilee 2000 campaign a few years ago to start thinking a little more radically about this biblical teaching of debt relief for those in need. But of course, it, that campaign didn't go far enough. It couldn't quite accept what the Bible really taught about debt and interest was that radical. I would argue that that development finance that we do provide needs to go on to a non-debt basis, be it through the World Bank or our own development aid. We either need to be very clear that it is grant, uh, interest-free debt that can be written off in, in uh, the appropriate circumstances, or it's equity investment. That means we start funding enterprises in countries we wish to help. The problem is, at the moment, we channel our aid through interest-based debt to governments. And that is, I'm afraid, a recipe for corruption on both sides. And we do not uh, institute uh, appropriate institute. Sorry, we don't encourage appropriate institutions in the economies of those we're trying to help. So I'm going to conclude. Um, we're in deep, deep trouble uh, because we have uh, allowed a multi-generation process of indebtedness to occur. We have subsidized it in the process of, and uh, 
found ourselves with debt burdens that we have no real way to resolve. We're only going to get out of the problem uh, through inflation, write-offs, or bank collapses under conventional thinking. We need to move debt into equity. We need to start writing off debts that find some way of doing that. And then we need to restructure our financial system onto a, ba on a, to a completely different basis, a, a basis that discourages debt actively. Um, I'm afraid that if we just go back to status quo, uh, we'll get into this problem very soon again. Thank you. And I'm going to be moderating the panel discussion and the question and answer session this evening. Just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm doing a DPhil in economics, and probably as many of you out there doing DPhils also think, I think my research is absolutely fascinating and I could talk about it all night, but I won't because that's not what we're here for. So I will move straight on to introduce uh, Professor Colin Mayer and Professor Jenny Corbett, who are our two panelists tonight. So first, uh, Professor Jenny Corbett uh, divides her time between Oxford University and Australian National University. I think you just came back a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so it gets about 12 months a year of uh, summer time. Although I think I would... Yeah, I, th I, I think I would trade my British summer for your Australian winter any day. Um, in Australia, Professor Corbett is Executive Director of the Australia-Japan Research Centre and in Oxford, she is reader in the economy of Japan at the Nissan Institute in St. Anthony's College. Professor Corbett's academic research focuses on the analysis of banking crises and on the links between financial systems and corporate governance with particular applications to Japan. In policy circles, Professor Corbett's acted as consultant to the OECD, Japan's financial services agency, and the Asian Development Bank Institute, and I could say a lot more, but just to keep it brief, the last thing I'll mention is that Professor Corbett is also a non-executive director of a credit union in Canberra, which is something I hope we can hear a bit more about tonight. Um, so please welcome Professor Jenny Corbett. <laughs> and uh, Professor Colin Mayer, um, those of you from the business school will no doubt recognise, uh, was the first professor at the Said Business School in 1994 and went on to preside as dean there from 2006 to 2011. He now continues as Peter Moore's Professor of Management Studies at the Business School and Professorial Fellow of Wadham College and Honorary Fellow of both Oriel and St Anne's. Uh, professor Mayer moves in both academic policy and practitioner circles. Just a few brief examples. As a practitioner, Professor Mayer was a long-time director of Oxera, one of the largest economic consultancies in the UK, and he's consulted widely to governments, uh, regulators, large firms, international agencies. In policy circles, he is a member of the Competition Appeal Tribunal, uh, he was previously a member of a fellow at the Bank of England and has been closely involved in the Centre for Economic Policy Research and the European Corporate Governance Institute. Within academia, Professor May has served on the editorial boards of several leading journals and has held positions at Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Brussels, and of course, here in Oxford. His research areas span corporate finance, governance, and regulation. So please welcome Professor Colin Mayer. <laughs> Um, now, our two, two new panellists have been, uh, agreed to sort of speak for five minutes just to give some initial responses, uh, and then we're going to have a time of uh, moderated discussion up here and uh, then open it to the floor for Q&A. Um, so please be scribbling down your questions ready to ask. Um, Jenny, would you like to begin? Okay, thanks very much. Well, thank you for this interesting opportunity, and um, I'm slightly daunted by having to follow a tour de force which um, has covered a great deal of ground and we were asked to respond to this um, discussion and, and to the points that Paul's raised rather than to come with our own uh, prepared uh, view of the world. So um, I want to 
say two or three things just to throw some ideas out and we can take them up later. Um, what I took from what Paul was saying is that uh, there are deep problems with the nature of debt and that we should be trying to think about solutions to financial system instability by <coughs> trying to think about a system that doesn't have debt in it. I find that idea not just challenging and, and certainly difficult to implement, but um, my view of the nature of debt contracts takes me in a different direction. Um, I think the point that Paul's making that is really important here is that finance is a relationship. And I think we agree on that. And then the question is, how can you take that insight and turn it into something that produces for us a financial system that delivers the benefits that we want and has somewhat fewer of the costs and uncertainties and instability. Um, I think the idea uh, that finance is a relationship is actually not a new idea. It's really fundamental and, and people who've thought about finance understand that it's fundamental. It always has been. Um, and I would say that a debt contract is particularly uh, a contract in which you can see those relational features and that it is not intrinsically a bad form of contract. Indeed, to my way of thinking, it has many aspects that make it preferable to an equity form of contract. If you think about what debt, a debt contract is, it's a contract between people to share risks. So a firm borrows money from a bank or I borrow money from you to do something, to carry out some activity that I cannot finance myself. I contract to return that money to you and indeed in our current view of debt, I guarantee also to pay you some interest. Now, we share, once that contract is signed, we share some risks. The borrower now has an obligation to return what was borrowed plus some interest. That puts some constraints on what the borrower can do with that money. You have to be finding something to do with that money that will generate enough to return the principal and the interest. You would be very foolish though it has happened, to borrow more than you could afford to repay. We'll come back to that question in a minute. The lender also shares some risks. The risk is that the borrower will default. But the point is here that both parties now are locked into a relationship in which each has obligations and each shares some risk. An equity contract, at least of the kind that we're used to in modern life, uh, doesn't have that feature. Essentially, the risk is all on one side. You can, if you're, take a firm as an example, you issue equity to finance your project, you have no obligation to the people who invest in your firm, you have no legal obligation to give them their money back. That's the nature of the contract that they've entered into with you. Now, it seems to me that if we're going to put weight on the relational nature of these contracts and use that to strengthen the system, we'd be better off looking at that relational aspect of debt. We clearly don't want to have a financial system in which funds cannot be transferred from areas where they're not being needed at the moment to areas where they are needed and can be used productively. So we must find ways to allow that financial intermediation to happen. And as Paul said, a debt contract is a simple, clear, clean way of doing that. Without debt, we would have had very much less economic growth. We would have more poverty 
we would have people unable to go to university, people unable to provide their housing. I think that we have to remember that whatever the problems that have been created by systemic failures in the way we have managed some aspects of debt, you should not overlook the fact that we've been able to do really important things as a result of having a financial system that allows that transfer of resources. So what we're after here is a way to reduce the real economic effects of financial crises and financial instability. And those are important, and I'm not going to go on at length about, but we will take them up, no doubt, in, in discussion. Um, but I do think that um, it is possible to run debt-based financial systems that don't have catastrophic real economic effects. And actually, if you look at the long sweep of history, although financial crises are quite frequent, we do have financial ups and downs, the number of occasions on which they cause really big economic hardship is pretty small for the sorts of complex financial systems that we run. So I would say that we might well want to think about the ways in which we change incentives so that borrowers are better informed and have good incentives not to borrow more than they ever intend to repay. And we also need to give incentives to lenders not to encourage over-borrowing. I think we've quite clearly agreed that it's over-indebtedness that is fundamentally the problem. Easier to recognise well, after the event than before. Yes and no. Let me. I'm going to speak later about the credit union experience, but I do think that that's um, an example of ways in which this can be done. So I'll stop and pass over to Colin. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. Uh, f first of all, I'd just like to say that I thought that Paul's talk was extremely interesting, and there's a vast amount that I agree uh, with in what he said. Uh, in fact, I agree with much of what both Paul and Jenny have said, so I'm going to hedge my bets. <laughs> we don't want too much agreement on the panel. <laughs> OK. Uh, but in some sense, I also think that Paul has not gone far enough. Uh, it's certainly the case. There, 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 there were three components, really, to Paul's talk. The first is the growth of debt and problems associated with it. The second is the need to introduce more relationships into debt. And the third is to attempt to replace debt with some form of equity sharing. But at the end of the day, he comes out with recommendations which sound extremely conventional, too big to fail, tax, more capital, smaller banks. Those are things that basically everyone is now advocating one form or another. And the reason why I don't think it goes far enough is basically what Jenny was saying, and that is that the financial crisis as such was not caused by debt, or it wasn't just caused by debt. It was in large part caused by equity. It was caused by shareholders knowing that they could benefit from the greater risk-taking of financial institutions and corporations more generally at the expense of debt, giving rise to precisely the exposure that uh, Jenny was talking about, the risks that creditors take in lending to institutions and other companies. And the notion that we need to have more relationships is certainly correct. But it's a critical element, not just in terms of debt contracts, but also in regard to equity. And as Jenny was saying, in many respects, developing the relationships on the equity side are harder than they are in relation to debt. Relationships in debt have been critical in the development of most successful economic activity around the world. It was paramount in the growth of the UK during its most successful period in the Industrial Revolution, when we had lots of local banking. It was, most, it was prevalent during the most successful period of the Japanese 
uh, growth era. And it's critically important in terms of alleviation of poverty from microfinance upwards, in terms of allowing economies to develop and to allowing communities and societies to fund their activities. So if we set about abolishing debt, we're going about things the wrong way. The real question is, how can we essentially establish greater degrees of relationships across the board, not just in terms of, of debt, but also in relation to equity and finance in general. Now, this is a subject that is of great interest to me from an economics, law, and philosophy perspective. But what I want to do is to address it in the context that we're discussing it tonight, and that is from a religious perspective, and in particular, to think of it in regard to what some of the messages that come out of the Old Testament in uh, relation to this issue are. The first point that I'd emphasize is that debt was regarded as being critically important. It was, it was largely regarded as being a central form of charity. Uh, and there was an obligation on those who borrowed to repay, as Paul was talking about, but there was equally well an obligation on those who lent not to exploit their position. Now, we all know about the points on usury and the prohibition of usury, but that actually was not the central element in terms of the restrictions. There were very clear limitations imposed on what creditors were allowed to do. They could not enter a, a debtor's home. They were supposed to return collateral to the borrower if the borrower needed it. Uh, they, in particular, were not permitted to take people into servitude. And indeed, the abhorrence of the notion of debt as introducing servitude came from the experience of being slaves in Egypt. But the notion of restraint in finance goes well beyond that because it was well known that it's not only the power of the creditor that was the problem, it was also the nature of the difference in position between people in business more, ge more generally. That there is what we term in economics an asymmetry of information, in particular between those who, for example, are selling goods and those who are buying them, and that it's difficult often for the buyer to establish the quality of what they're purchasing. Well, there were very clear presumptions that there was an obligation on the seller to behave in an honest fashion, and a notion of implied warranty, so that if you did not get what you were expecting, if it was not fit for purpose, then it was the obligation of the seller to ensure that they made good. And the underlying principle that really resides behind Jewish and Christian thinking on this is the notion that even what is unobservable to others is still observable to God, and you should know before whom you will ultimately stand. Because God knows one's intent and there lies the ultimate judgment. But the principle also goes further than that. It's not simply one of fear of punishment or retribution that lies at the heart. It's the notion that there is an obligation on people, and in particular parents, to provide their children with a moral ed education. And that the notion of education as instilling concepts of self, of, of avoiding selfishness and greed lie at the heart of this. Um, so that, as one authority has put it, the reward of God promises us for doing his will so that you will benefit and you will live long is infinite and offers us a delight beyond human imagination, a reward that one can only experience in the infinite world of the afterlife. So a notion that underlies the principle of trying to establish relationships 
is, yes, you will be ultimately judged by God, and secondly, that there is an obligation on us as parents, as teachers, to instill the notion of what it is to act in a selfless fashion. So the problem that we're addressing today is not one of essentially elimination of debt and its replacement with equity, because there are, as Jenny was saying, many advantages and drawbacks to both forms of finance. What is needed is a greater notion of obligation and responsibility uh, associated with all forms of finance and all forms of business arrangements, which in part derives from moral upbringing and education which we provide to others. And it's these pursuits that have been essentially lost uh, over the last decades and in, over the last century. Now, the ways in which one needs then to address uh, the problems associated with responsibility and relationships in different forms of finance is through these concepts of what it means to be a moral person. And alongside that, economics and finance can do a great deal to promote that through developing appropriate forms of institutions that assist with ensuring that we behave in a moral rather than an immoral fashion, but also religion and the notions of morality that we instill in others are a critical component in terms of the way in which one returns to relationship financing and forms of responsible financing that are not tied to particular types of finance, but are more general in terms of their pervasiveness in financial systems and economic systems. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating ideas, and one of the things that strikes me is um, that I'm hearing you talk from a perspective which draws on faith uh, or worldview, which I did the MPhil in economics here, and it was treated as almost an entirely technical subject. And when I read the newspapers daily, um, finance, financial questions to me are presented, it seems, as if they're purely technical. Um, it seems, is, is there a, what, what is the appropriate role of sort of worldview or faith or philosophy in these questions? And if, as I hear you saying, um, we need more of sort of moral education and, and, and something that underpins that. Why, why have we lost it and how do we regain it? Okay, so, so ba basically what's happened is that um, economics has focused very heavily on particular aspects of relationships. In, in particular, there are three th components of uh, knowledge that we've derived from e economics that focus on contracts, incentives, and control, okay? So that, uh, as, as, as we were discussing earlier on, there's a, a very strong element that basically the way in which economic transactions are organized is through the signing of contracts. And the way in which we ensure that people act in relation to those contracts is by giving them appropriate incentives. And if they don't do it through incentives, then we exercise control over them. <coughs> Now, that, that, that has a number of important features associated with it, and in certain circumstances, it works quite well. But we equally well know that the vast proportion of activities in which we are engaged are not actually covered by contracts. We have relationships with people that are informal in nature. And what economics has not had anything to say about is really how to handle those non-contractual arrangements. And the vast proportion of people around the world, in particular once you move outside of the developed world, are in a position where they have no contractual relationships, where they are basically uh, exposed to the behavior of others without the protection of any formal legal uh, uh, arrangements. And so the notion, what, 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 what economics is focused on 
is an important but very narrow component of the nature of people's interactions with each other. And what this is saying is that the, the other component, which is more relationship in nature, is one that is critically important and where, going forward, economics will have a great deal to say. And we're beginning to see a merging of views that come from different disciplines, from sociology, from philosophy, law, as well as economics, which will place much more emphasis on notions of obligation, responsibility, and commitment. And the real question that economics needs to address going forward is, how does one move from a focus on pure contractual incentive control view of the world to one that allows one to build up theories of relationships, obligations, and commitment. And that is what is beginning to happen, and that's how it's going to change. Okay. Of course. So, Jenny, I mean, this, uh, I think Colin's saying that economics has become, and finance has become very narrow, um, and there's quite optimistic about the scope for that to expand into a more holistic view of relationships. What, what do you think about that? I think there's another element. I, I mean, I do agree with him, but I think that there's another element also. We've Economics has always uh, been um, based on a model of the rational individual, mm -hmm. and that's for as much for analytical convenience as for actually a belief that that's the way people behave. But it is easier to analyse actions that are taken by an automaton who just works out <laughs> what is the best <laughs> outcome. Yeah. Now, we always knew that that wasn't the real world, but it became very pervasive in the sort of economics that we understood and taught. What, so the other development that has begun to change that view of the world is the introduction of, of psychology into economics. So behavioural economics, the, the use of experimental methods where you actually go out and find out how people behave under certain circumstances. I think that brings also quite an interesting possibility for expanding our way of understanding how people actually interact because this is not only about the choices that they make for themselves in a single standalone transaction, but it also is helps to explain how people behave towards other people when they're carrying out what are, appear to be just economic transactions. Mm. Um, and I think that is also going to allow <laughs> us to begin to understand more about what motivates people and why it is that they are behaving in the way that they are in these crucial areas of, of finance and risk taking and um, greed and so on. That if we if we can't use the insights that disciplines like psychology bring to that and br bring it into economics, that would be a missed opportunity. But it is it is beginning to happen. Okay, so I this. I hear you generally agreeing that uh, this relational perspective is actually quite useful, um, maybe something that has a history but has been neglected, um, and has promised an economic theory, but just to move it to sort of maybe something that um, those of us who are not econo well, I'm an economist but f find these things fascinating, more broadly, what, what difference does it make in practice if we take this relational perspective? And maybe you could talk, Jenny, about... Uh, the Credit union, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's got sort of more relational philosophy behind it. How does that yeah. change things? Yeah. And I think it is, it also illustrates perhaps, or perhaps helps it to explain where I'm coming from in terms of saying that I don't think that debt contracts, and certainly I think that, you know, banking, which is based on taking in deposits and making loans, is not inherently a, a bad way of running a banking system. So, and the credit unions illustrate that extremely well. So the origin of credit unions and other mutual societies is that a group of people come together and make an arrangement whereby those who have money which they don't currently need lend it to those who have a current need. And the, the institutional form that you develop to do that is a 
a mutual organization in which you don't have shareholders, but the, the members of the organization own the organization. Some of them are depositors, some of them are borrowers. And yet the contract form looks exactly like a bank. It looks exactly like a form of ordinary debt contract. Now those organizations, of which there are many, many thousands, um, have provided a, a perfectly well-functioning mechanism for doing the things that, that debt contracts can do. They, they allow people to set up small businesses, buy their own homes, do these things. And those organizations, when you look at the financial structure of them, they are mostly extremely um, simple, uh, not prone to very much cyclical um, and peculiar financial behavior, and they have typically been very safe. They don't go, uh, they don't become insolvent very frequently. There have been occasions, and the US savings and loans crisis is certainly one, where regulatory changes which gave incentives to increase risk taking went badly wrong. So that can happen. Okay, so, but, so Paul, could, that, could credit unions be the, be the answer? Is this, is this a way to get around the problems of debt? It's a sort of intermediary step. So I don't want to be misunderstood as saying, oh, we must move, or I'm advocating a move to a non-debt financial system now because that's far too disruptive. So, so some of the policy prescriptions were sort of moving into that direction rather than saying, oh, we've got to get there straight away. And yes, uh, microfinance and credit unions are a more relational way in which that the, the debt contract can be controlled and limited. Mm -hmm. um, it is still using an intermediary to sort of buffer that relationship. Um, but if that balance sheet is effect effectively repressed by regulation to stop the risk taking, um, then it, it is a sustainable and in, in many ways an in, in, in intermediary step. It is a more, much more desirable way than having joint stock banking and other things. So, so when you're talking about intermediary, do you mean that it's an intermediary step on the way to Well, this, that's, that's this if we were or, or you starting about? to think about um, could we move, if, if we're going to be purist, and actually what is the end point? Do oh. we think that we need to get rid of debt contracts. And but you're not talking about intermediation between no, borrower and no, lender? No, okay. No. So, yes, I'm, I'm saying that in many uh, local contexts or in many um, development contexts, microfinance and uh, credit unions are a much more desirable uh, form of intermediation than commercial banking. Okay. So I'm not saying, oh, this, this doesn't work either or I want to get rid of that. Okay. Um, I'm just saying that um, the, the problem is that, yes, you can keep those things on a, on a small scale, but if you don't buy that sort of systemic direction, mm -hmm. um, the debt process wants to, seems to generate political and economic incentives to start undermining the constraints. Okay. To do things on a larger and larger basis because it's it's a, it's trying to find private profit at public expense, and so there are, there will be uh, lobbying. They won't say it by the U.S. credit unions to deregulate their treasury function uh, that has just gone bust and needed big bailout by the other credit unions in the U.S. So, just because these are mutual organisations, they don't necessarily. Um, uh, eliminate these incentives um, and so we've had building societies in the 1980s get into trouble because they grew too big and just came became part of that credit generating uh, machine okay so uh, I think it'd be, it'd be good if we could really na uh, sort of hone down on what what precisely is is the nature of the problem with that I hear um, on the one hand Paul you're saying that um, 
there's something really fundamental in the nature of debt or the processes it engenders which are the problem. And But Jenny, earlier you were saying really that the issue is more about over-indebtedness, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe debt can be a good thing, finance, used to finance good things, but you can have too much of a good thing. Is that, is, is that the... Is it one of these two things, or is there other, what's, what else is going on? What's, what's the, precisely the nature of the problem? Well, I think um, I'll sort of start... Well, I should have perhaps said it in the speech, but I'll start with this, the spiritual diagnosis of what I think Jesus is talking about in the parable of the talents when he says, putting my money at the bankers at interest is reaping where you haven't sown, okay. which is what hard men do. Okay. And so, so that's about risk and reward. You're not. Yeah. So you're, you're taking a reward without um, where you shouldn't be. So this is the because idea. Because you've not taken risks. Yes. Yeah, okay. Because um, although we sort of seem to have a strange dichotomy of view on what what is risk taking and equity in a debt contract, effectively the traditional position has been that you need to have ownership risk in order to earn the reward of capital provision. Okay. That if uh, in a debt contract, legally, the money has transferred to the borrower, and therefore the risk has transferred to the borrower. And so they're under an obligation just to repay <coughs> what they've borrowed. And this is sort of classic Thomas Aquinas view of critique of interest. You can't rent money. Um, and so there's this idea that taking interest on on money on debt is taking a reward when you haven't taken risk. Mm. In the sort of spiritual position before God, what is effectively a debt contract is doing in the legal terms, that's not necessarily how it's applied as, as we have common shares at the moment, which there's all sorts of problems with how we do equity finance, I'm perfectly happy to admit, um, is that debt, a debt contract is making a claim on both sides about the future. It's making a promise, and it's effectively saying, um, from the borrower's perspective, I will not just lend, repay, but I will make a return, or I will be in a position to repay more in the future. The problem biblically with that idea is that uh, we should not be making claims about the future with certainty. So James chapter 4 says, if a businessman talks about future profit with certainty this is all such boasting is evil only god knows the future and you need to be contracting on a contingent basis god willing and so in one sense the a sort of debt contract is making a a a claim a rigid hard promise mm -hmm. in the future and yes the system can survive if that, those promises and that ambition is repressed and you, and you don't allow over-indebtedness and you keep it regularly, reasonably suppressed and it won't do too much damage. Um, but the problem is, I'm afraid this, the system, um, the sort of political economy of the system generates uh, these cycles of over-indebtedness and then that has to be resolved through inflation, uh, bailout, uh, default, depreciation or whatever. Okay. What do you think of this, Colin? I think we've heard some very interesting views on what, in some circumstances, have been successful. For example, credit unions have played a very important role. Mutual institutions in this country, building societies and the like, have been a very important component of the financing of some activities. Uh, equity has played an important role in terms of the financing of small companies and the funding of large companies. And there have also been dramatic failures in relation to uh, all of these activities as well. The savings and loans crisis in, 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 in the United States, the fact that venture capital finance has largely dried up in the UK and it's very difficult for companies to be able to fund uh, their activities on an equity basis. The fact that um, large companies that have been subject to takeovers have laid off substantial fractions of their workforce. That there are problems with all forms of 
financial relationships and contracts and non-contractual forms. The issue isn't can we simply solve the problem by changing or eliminating some forms of financial arrangements. That won't help because basically all that you're doing is you're constraining the available resources and ways in which people can transact with each other. And for the most part, that gives rise to a reduction, not an enhancement in uh, economic welfare. And one of the greatest uh, developments over the last 10 or 20 years in finance around the world has been some alleviation of poverty through the development of microfinance institutions. Now, those are largely debt-based. There are problems with them. There's been serious problems with them recently in terms of exploitation of excessively high interest rates. All these institutions have something to contribute. All these contracts have something to contribute, but they've also all got potentially serious failures with them if they are abused. And the question isn't then, can one solve it simply by prohibiting some types of institutions? One may be able to do a bit by regulating them better, but at the end of the day, it has to come back to the self-administration of responsibility of those who are running those institutions. And any institution and any lender can uh, can expropriate uh, other parties. On the other hand, if their activities are based on what are deemed to be um, acceptable uh, principles, then those institutions and individuals can play a very important role. And what it in large part then boils down to being are questions about the ownership, the control, the uh, governance of institutions so that there is a strong sense of obligation and responsibility and commitment uh, from people running those institutions and providing the different types of finance so that they do not exploit others because we will otherwise potentially be undermining rather than contributing to the welfare and alleviation of poverty through trying to interfere in ways which actually uh, is not conducive to better performance. Okay. Thanks. Well, this is, a, I think, a very knotty question. We're not going to completely untie tonight. I'm very conscious of wanting to give time for audience Q&A. Um, so just a, a final quick question, if you could maybe just in three sentences uh, explain to the audience, and we've got out here probably lots of students with loans and people with mortgages, um, maybe credit cards maybe even people who are savers and actually, without realizing it, are lenders because they're saving in the bank or with their, their pension. What should they do? How does, for all, all, all of this uh, institutional, you know, how do, what does it boil down to? How do we behave differently? Just well, I, it, I have to understand um, the in, motives and incentives of the person. Mm -hmm. Um, as a Christian, because I need to know whether I'm giving them advice from the perspective of how best to you manage your finances, or do I talk to them about how you should be helping others with your finances? Because uh, that is, coming from the parable of the unjust steward, that is what money should be used for to get yourselves friends at the judgment, Luke 16.9. And so, um, therefore, I would be seeking uh, for those in debt uh, to be honoring that promise uh, because you, uh, it is the wicked who don't repay, uh, according to Psalms, um, but that you then need to try and turn yourself around, limit consumption, uh, seek interest-free loans to pay off interest-bearing loans or whatever, to essentially become free okay. as soon as possible. Um, and to, in a sense, 
be, get out of the bondage to the system. Okay. Getting free from bondage. Jenny, how would you, what would you advocate? I think I'm more pragmatic and less philosophical than either of the other two panels. So I would say, join a credit union. <laughs> <laughs> Think about... It's just unfortunate they don't live in Australia, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you have them here. There are... Think about, as, as uh, Paul says, it, how you use your finance to benefit others. Well, that is the purpose of mutual organisations. I also think that you should understand the nature of some of the um, obligations that you have which seem... Uh, which may seem onerous and unpleasant, but which can be viewed in a different way. I was very interested to hear you say, it, to talk about contingent lending. And it, my, so let me take the example of student debt, all right? Australia has bequeathed to the world a model of financing higher education, which everybody thinks of as being a terrible debt burden on students, right? You have to pay something like full cost fees now all of a sudden, and the way you do this is the government lends you money. And that all seems like a terrible thing. Students will live with this debt burden for the rest of their lives. Well, stop a minute. You are receiving an education which puts you in a position to earn an income well above what the average taxpayer will earn. Why should the average taxpayer pay for your education? Is that fair? No. So what we have designed is an income contingent loan where you, the beneficiaries of an education that earns you a return, will repay to the taxpayer some of that excess return if and when you earn it. And if you don't, it's income contingent, so if you don't ever earn that excess return, you don't repay them there. Now that does not seem to me to be an onerous contract. It seems to me to be a beautifully designed debt contract <laughs> that we should be thinking seriously about for a number of other purposes. And it is the kind of contract whereby we use finance to help people. That's where I would come down. Okay, thank you. Surely we can sell shares in people. <laughs> <laughs> Much simpler. <laughs> That's slavery. Yes. <laughs> You're getting it. <laughs> Colin. Well, after Jenny's just told you what a wonderful deal you've got. <laughs> Uh, from the uh, government in giving you these uh, contingent loans. Let me then turn the, uh, the uh, table the other way around and say that that then confers an obligation on you later on, once you're in a position of essentially determining how others have access to finance and how corporations are run, including the banks, to ensure that they are run according to sound principles and principles that you feel now as borrowers you would like to see others uh, pursue. So my, my recommendation is to think in terms of how you can learn lessons from both the religious education you've had and the education you've had here for what you're going to be doing later on, and from the um, position that you're going to be in, in terms of influencing the lives of others. Because I think in the long term, that is the greatest contribution that you can make. Thank you very much. Your turn. <laughs> Questions? Does anybody have a question? Can I see a hand? At the back there, yes, please. We maybe just pass, pass the microphone over. But please keep them brief. Um, in the interest of time, we want to get through as many as possible. Okay, well, my question's only three pages long, if that's okay. Okay, we well, can just boil that down to three words, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, actually, I should say uh, first that I was the first beneficiary of that wonderful tax system that you were talking about, uh, and uh, I had the pleasure of paying back my, uh, my student fees uh, through the government program. And actually, I was one of the minority who actually thought it was a good idea. 
um, but it was a minority. Um, my question is actually around this conversation where you talk about debt and equity. Um, and and I, I fear that there's a lot of uh, labels used around those things where we talk about debt uh, because we structure a debt contra contract and equity because it's called equity and sits in the, um, in, the, in the bottom line. But if you go and talk to a small business who's approached a venture capitalist and that venture capitalist wants uh, a very, very significant return, they take a very significant portion of the shareholding of the, of the company and want an exit point, how is that actually any different or uh, any better than, than an associated you know, going to a bank and getting a debt contract, uh, it would seem to me that that equity is far more onerous than any sort of debt you could go and get. And from a, a sort of usury perspective, uh, it, it seems more usurious, if that's a word, uh, than, that, than going and getting a, a standard structured debt contract. So how, how does equity play in, in your mind? And I think... Um, uh, 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 Paul, I think that it's, it comes to, to your question that you were feeling that equity was a better player in this, in this space uh, where I think there's a lot of evidence and, and you might argue that the, the dot-com crash, for example, was uh, excessive equity, um, uh, you kind of gone mad. Paul, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Good Paul. First of all, you'll notice that we survived the dot-com crisis relatively well. Didn't have systemic consequences because uh, financing of shares was not financed by banks. So um, if you now look at the growing literature on what are the best predictors of a financial crisis, it's not equity booms because they're generally not uh, now leveraged after the, we learned from 1929 crash you don't leverage equity. Uh, they're largely due to property bubbles financed by bank contracts. So I'm, uh, on a systemic basis, I'm, I'm looking, it's much safer for the system to be intermediating large capital flows through equity uh, that has the price mechanism built in as a cushion. So you're not, not holding equity and thinking, I can lever this position up and I'm going to be safe. If you're holding equity, you know it's volatile and therefore you don't. Um, the uh, usurious nature of venture capital is a sign to me of market failure, that there's not enough coming in because our savings are channeled largely through debt contracts that are cheap, it's cheap to borrow because there's an oversupply of credit uh, and savings through that mechanism. Again, uh, this is a, a product of both our history and our regulatory system and our tax system. Um, if we were to take away all the tax benefits to debt financing, if we were to take away all the capital benefits of banks, uh, I, can, I would anticipate there would be a lot more supply of cheaper equity and debt would be a whole lot more expensive. The system as a whole would be much uh, less volatile and safer. Um, and of course, just to note that as you get less debt in the system, equity becomes less risky. Because don't forget that debt is taking the first slice of the return on capital, and often there's very little equity. And therefore, all the volatility, all the fluctuations have to be accommodated first by equity. As you move the system to much more, much less leverage, much bigger equity cushion, equity itself becomes much less volatile, much more stable. So I would be generally saying that we must at a minimum remove the, the tax breaks to debt. We would then eliminate the private equity industry, which is essentially a tax arbitrage one. Uh, equ equity, the stock market would become much more stable and uh, savers would start thinking they, it, it's actually safer to hold, uh, to hold equity. I would personally go further and say that because of these uh, toxic <coughs> components, we ought to be tax disincentivizing debt because it, it spreads costs to others. And if we took away all the implicit guarantees on banks, I can assure you there'd be a lot more equity finance going on because we 
things are, uh, finance is channeled largely to where there's regulatory arbitrage or tax benefit. So all of a sudden, as Jenny will tell you, um, Japanese banks hold enormous numbers of bonds because they don't have a capital charge. Jenny, you got one? Okay. Um, could I, could I just say that I think that this view that if one eliminated debt that somehow things would get transferred to equity is very misleading. We've in fact in the UK over the last hundred years experienced a progressive decline in the willingness of banks to lend to industry. And we haven't observed a corresponding increase in the availability of equity finance. On the contrary, equity finance has become increasingly hard to get and more expensive. And the observation about the importance of financing for small companies through venture capital finance <coughs> is, I think, a very imp important one, that it is an extremely expensive and difficult source of finance for companies to raise. And if one tries to diminish the availability of debt finance, essentially what one will do is drive up the cost of capital and make it progressively harder for small companies to fund their activities to grow, for entrepreneurship to happen, and indeed for large companies to finance their activities. So far from there being a switch from simply debt to equity, the net consequence will be to diminish the overall level of ec economic activity. Can I just uh, add that it's equity plus leasing? So it's, it's not just equity, pure equity. Well, e e e equity plus leasing is then basically a mixture of equity and debt. And what you would end up with was a large component of the leasing with rather little of the equity. Can I take another question? Uh, yes. There's a gentleman there with glasses. I was wondering, uh, I don't know if I heard well or didn't hear well, but um, as far as the current problem is concerned, i.e. the crisis of this time around, I think Paul gave us some ideas of how we could potentially get out of this. Now, the rest have said something about how they're going to approach with this, but they haven't given any alternatives. I don't know if you heard or not. Could you give some alternatives on how we could get out of the current crisis for example? Okay. So could you maybe just spell out really simply what the alternative financing is? If I'm a company and I need to raise money um, and I can't take a loan because we've ruled out debt, what can I do? Or if I'm a household and I want to buy a house, what do I do? That's what I was thinking first. No, I think the, the question is about how do we get out of our current mess. Mm. Okay, it's the process part. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I think the challenge was to Paul and me because you've already well, given I can, a list. I can give you some more. I can give yeah, you some more. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, look, um, my list includes um, some uh, focusing to considerable extent on the way in which bankers and financiers are paid and what their incentives are to encourage the system that leads to excessive lending and borrowing and, and excessive risk taking. So systems of remuneration that leave individuals not liable for the consequences of the systemic problem that they create um, are obviously a, an important part of what's fed into, into the current uh, set of problems. And, uh, you know, so having systems where bankers or other people in the financial markets get rewarded for churning and creating lots of turnover and creating lots of volume of activity without worrying about the, the quality of that and whether, in fact, this money is going to ever come back, uh, which is the nature of the, the 
contracts that we have in many of these institutions has been a big part of the problem. And that can be changed. Um, I'm not sure what has been going on in this country, but I do know what's been going on in Australia. And I speak again from personal experience because I've chaired the remuneration committee of my credit union. I have had to set the salary of our CEO and of all of the significant officers of our organization. And I have to account now to the regulator for the way in which I do that. Now, it's extremely tedious and painful, but I actually think it's a very good thing because in our case, we're not talking about the kind of contract that's a problem, nor are we talking about the kind of amounts of money. But if I have to do it and the big guys have to do it, then we have some, some constraint. And the, the principles that have been brought in are that um, you have to be able to show that the performance indicators that you're using to, to decide the salary do not encourage sort of blind risk taking so that you have to make these managers accountable for the outcomes, not just the activity. If you're at the big end of town and you're giving people big bonuses, you also have to have clawback conditions in them now so that even five years after they leave an organisation, <coughs> if the actions that they took can be shown to have led to drastic outcomes, they can actually be forced to repay <coughs> monies that they were paid. And, and I can tell you that, that our regulators take this very seriously when they, and they visit your financial institution once a year and they grill you about how you do this. So we can begin to address these things. Uh, it's, not, it's not tough enough yet, and it's not, in some places it's not happening, but I think that should be part of, you know, and again, it's a, it's a way of making people take responsibility and changing the culture, you know, so that it becomes not acceptable to behave in that sort of reckless fashion. So that certainly is one of the things that, that we need to look at. Okay, I, I deliberately had not put forward my own views because I wanted to comment on what Paul was saying. But as I've been asked, I will now put forward my, my, my views. And I think there are three elements that are critical to what I describe as being restoring trust in corporations and institutions because that's what's basically happened. It's a breakdown of trust. And I agree with Paul when he says that we're not going to solve this problem simply through greater regulation. Regulation has been tried and it's repeatedly tried as a way of solving problems that arise within institutions. What is really needed is for institutions to grapple with the problems themselves. And there are three components that are critical to restoring trust in corporations. The first one is that they need to have owners who have an interest in what they do. Currently, the ownership of the average holding period of shares in companies has fallen to less than eight months. It was eight years, eight, eight years, some 70 years ago, and it's progressively fallen to less than eight months. A vast number of shareholders hold shares for less than a month, less than a day, sometimes less than a second or a nanosecond. If you've got an ownership duration, of a second or a minute, you haven't really got much interest in what happens to the long-term prospects for your company. That's not a very good basis for the ownership of institutions. And it's one of the reasons why just thinking about equity as a solution to the problem is not the right way to go. First thing we need to think about is how do we get the right shareholders, by which one basically means committed shareholders. The second thing is that it hasn't only been a problem with shareholders. As we well know, many directors, and in particular non-executive directors, have basically been asleep on the job. And we need to have, we need to have directors who have a real involvement in understanding of, accountability for, and interest in what happens to their organization. 
And basically, that involves moving over towards governance systems that are essentially much closer to the way in which we view the operations of trusts than we do of corporations. And indeed, some of the merits of what Jenny was talking about in relation uh, to uh, some types of institutions is that they come much closer, the mutuals come much closer to being uh, run on a trust basis than on a traditional commercial basis. And that is another element that would have moved one much more in the direction of responsibility, not just in relation to debt, but also in relation to equity. And the final component that is critical is that companies need to make clear the values by which they stand. Currently, the only value that seriously dominates the operation of companies and institutions and banks is to maximize shareholder returns. That focus on shareholder returns has been devastating. It's been devastating in terms of the risk taking that banks have been willing to engage in. And it's not the way in which companies have traditionally been run. The most successful organizations are those, many with a firm religious root, for example, the Quaker organizations in Britain, on the principle that their duty is not simply to their shareholders, but to their employees and their customers, and they have responsibility to those people. And what they're trying to do is to deliver services for their customers and to take account of the interests of their employees as well as their creditors <coughs> and shareholders or investors, whatever, whatever form they may be. And that is what is required to restore trust in corporations. We need them to have values that go beyond a pure shareholder perspective. And we need owners who then have a long-term interest. And we need those who are running the companies, the directors, to be in a position where they are firmly accountable and have an involvement to ensure that those values are delivered. That is what is required, not simply a shift from debt to equity. Well, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for now. Um, but would you join with me in thanking our panellists for an absolutely fascinating discussion? Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.